Good morning. Good to have you with us again today. Last week we were in Revelation chapter 9, and we saw the, the trumpet judgments 5 and 6, part of the three woes that are unfolding. What we see here is, is God's judgments coming to an end. We saw that, that the world, as a response, simply refused to repent to Jesus Christ. It is a pivot point in the book of Revelation where we were. And now, and now we move into to, uh, an interlude before the seventh trumpet sounds. And what we see here is significant in these next pieces. John's going to give us more information that's very significant to us, not only to those churches who are receiving this for the first time, but to us as a church who is living and breathing today and serving Jesus Christ, to you and I who are living in a, in a world that's filled with evil, these pages and the words on these pages still speak to your life and to my life as well. What we find here in chapter 10 is this. Uh, there's going to be no more delay in God's ultimate final judgment here against the earth. We're going to be moving towards the scene of the second half of the tribulation. But first we encounter in, uh, some information that's going to be helpful to us and uh, communicated to us by Christ. No more delay. Again, the focal point is Jesus Christ. All of Revelation is about Him. He is, bringing, he is bringing the consummation of history together. Everything is being fulfilled in Him as He fulfills the, the will of His Father, as His eternal kingdom and the kingdom of His Father are going to be brought together for all eternity. God is moving humanity towards that place where sin is going to be dealt with finally. Folks, I can't wait. These are some horrible scenes that we see on the pages here of Revelation. But it is, it is moving towards a time when sin will finally, ultimately be eradicated, erased from human history. Folks, that's the worst thing that, that we deal with day in and day out. We deal with a difficult, fallen world, a world filled with adversity because sin is a reality. It's a reality in all of our lives. It's a reality in everything that we do. Sin is a horror. It is a cancer. It cannot be defeated except through Christ who has won the victory. Now we're seeing that victory become a reality. Folks, that's going to be our victory one day. We're going to experience the blessings and the reality of being in the presence of Jesus Christ who has won this victory for us. Let's pick it up in verse and chapter 10. And we see again reflected uh, information about Jesus Christ. Verse 10, verse 1 and verse 3. I saw another mighty angel. We see is the majesty. The majesty of Jesus Christ is reflected here in these verses. It's important to see and under, to see and understand that. We have a divine messenger in, in, in these verses. And the, the question that, that comes is, this messenger an angel or not? I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. And he called out with a loud voice, like a lion roaring when he called out. The seven thunders sounded. That's verse 1, and that's verse 3. You have another mighty angel. There are many commentators, and many who come to this, these verses and say, this is Jesus Christ. There are many who come to this passage and say, no, it's not. It's, a, it's an angel. I, I can see both sides, but I lean towards an angel for, for a very specific reason. Again, in the Greek, we, we see here in verse 1, I saw another mighty angel. That word another is alos, which is another of the same kind, not heteros, which is another of a different kind. Again, we're giving a picture here that this creature is, is like the angels that we've already seen before us. It's not something distinctly different, although this angel is very different. It still is of the angelic realm that we see here. Uh, why many believe that this is this could be Jesus Christ himself is because of the descriptions that are, that are laid here. I mean, look look at the majesty of this angel. Look at the description of this angel. We see these descriptions said of Christ in chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, and chapter 5, verse 5, the Lion of Judah, of, of chapter 4, verse 3, and the, and the rainbow that is the heavenly rainbow. We see, we see these descriptions wrapped in a cloud that takes us back to the Old Testament, the the cloud of the tabernacle, Jesus Christ being lifted up in the cloud and coming again on the cloud. We see that reality. We see his face like the sun. Again, a description of Jesus Christ. Legs like a pillar of fire, Old Testament tabernacle. Jesus Christ we see in Revelation 5. We see called out with a loud voice like a lion, the lion of Judah. Boy, I tell you what the similarities are. 
Boy, they're there. I'm just telling you, they're, they're right there. And he calls out, and the thunder sounded. It's the, it, the seven thunders of what we see here. It's, it, again, it's the, it's the voice of God itself. And, um, and so we see this reality. Is this an angel? Is this Jesus Christ? Well, one thing I've learned is similarity doesn't necessarily mean the same. This, I believe, is a messenger of Jesus Christ reflecting Jesus Christ. We're going to see that as we walk through this. And remember the very first verse of the book of Revelation. We see here the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel. Now we see Jesus Christ in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. Here we see an angel that is, that is uh, at, at the disposal of Jesus Christ. Is this angel in chapter 10 that angel? We don't know. We don't know that for sure. It seems to me, because the way the Greek uses the word other, because um, uh, of that reality, that this is an angel, a mighty angel. We, have, we see other mighty angels here in the book of Revelation, not just this place here. That this is a, another mighty, powerful angel who is intended to, conv to convey the character, the authority of Jesus Christ, which we're going to see. He is a messenger under the authority of Jesus Christ. He is a messenger reflecting the character, the voice, the message of Jesus Christ. That is, I think that's really key. That's what we see here in these, in these first two verses. Um, we see Jesus Christ in this passage. Remember, no more delay. He is over all of creation. We see, we see divine ownership in, in this chapter here about Jesus Christ. We see that in verse 2. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, this, this angel does. What's the significance of that? Well, there's actually great significance in that. So let's look at that. This is, this is key here in the book of Revelation. This is key to this passage. It's key to our understanding of Scripture and of who Christ is. Here, Jesus Christ, I believe, is honored as creator of the universe. Chapter 5, we saw him being worshipped as such. I heard every creature in heaven and earth and sea. That's who he's straddling. Sea and earth, he's straddling here. And they're worshipping who? The Lamb. Yes, the Father on the throne, but also the Lamb forever and ever. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, we see clearly that Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe. By him, by Jesus Christ, all things were created. All things were created through him and for him. The word of God is very clear and very explicit. God the Father is lifted up in chapter 4 of Revelation as the creator. Yet at the same time, he shares that with the son, Jesus Christ, who here explicitly was involved with overseeing the act of creation of all things. There is nothing that's created that wasn't created by Jesus Christ, the word of God tells us. Man was created for dominion. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us, I believe that's the Trinity there, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the earth, over the sea. God created Adam and Eve. He gave them dominion over the earth. To rule the earth, to be what? King, queen. To be, to, to set the spiritual tone over the, those who would come after them. To be the ones who would set that a tone of following after Jesus Christ. So we know sin ruined everything, Romans 5.12. Sin came into this world through one man, through Adam. And death came because of the result of sin, and it had it spread to every man, woman, and child who has ever lived. And so Jesus Christ created all things. He gave this earth as a gift to us, to man, to Adam and Eve. And sin came in and ruined that all. Because of that, the dominion that man had, man lost that dominion of the earth. Man lost that dominion. So, so we see Jesus Christ rectifying that all the way through Scripture. We see Jesus Christ dealing with that sin problem all the way through this, the Word of God. That's what this is about. A Savior. About grace. About eternal promise. And so the God of this world has taken dominion, as it were, of this world. The God of this world. The one who blinds the minds of unbeliever. Satan himself has, has, in that sense, dominion over this earth because of the sin of man holding man in bondage. The perfect world that was created has fallen into the dominion of sin and bondage and death. 
In fact, when Jesus Christ came and he ministered on this earth, Satan had the gall, had the audacity to give, to, to offer to Jesus Christ the heavens and the earth and the sea. He took them to a high mountain. He showed them all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He says, you just bow down. You just bow down and you worship me. I'll give you all these things. They are not his to give. Jesus Christ created them all. He is still owner of all things. Dominion, in quotes, is under the dominion of, of Satan right now. And yet he is under the authority of Jesus Christ. Daniel gives us a prophecy. Daniel is so key to the book of Revelation. To him, that's referring ultimately to Jesus Christ, he has given dominion and glory and a kingdom, an everlasting one. We saw in Revelation 5, Jesus is worthy to take that kingdom. When he takes that scroll, he is being given the title deed back to heaven and earth. He earned that through his death on the cross for you and I. He earned that simply through being God, simply through being the Son of God, simply through being divine. He expressed that it was his by giving his life for you and I. He won our freedom, folks. He won your freedom. He is. He has... He took that title deed away from Satan. Satan thought he had it. Satan thought he had this world. He lost it. Jesus Christ won it. He is worthy to dispense the judgment to do what he's about to do. And so as the angel steps here in verse 2 over the sea and the land, one on one and one on the other, over this whole world, he's revealing that what's about to be communicated and, and judgment dispensed is going to affect the whole world. But he's also communicating that this world belongs to to Christ. He is taking it back. That's what he's doing. What he did at the cross, the power of that victory is now being realized as Jesus Christ is judging the earth and will establish his kingdom on earth. Taking back, reclaiming an eternal kingdom. Let chapter 11 verse 5. With the seventh trumpet, this is what's going to be declared in chapter 11 verse 15. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's what's taking place here in verse 2. There is a reclamation, reclamation project. <laughs> there is ownership being declared. There is ownership um, that, is, that is being claimed by Jesus Christ. Of this earth. Satan is again losing here in this verse. Jesus is all-knowing. We see in verse 4, we see in verse 6, we have a divine timetable that is being operated under here. When the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, John says, I was about to write, as God spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. Whatever is spoken here by God, whatever is spoken, John is not able to write it down. And then we move on to verse 6, that there would be no more delay. So whatever is said is moving this forward and there's not going to be any more delay. In the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, which is the next which is the next trumpet, five and six we've just seen last week. Seven is coming. We're in this interlude. When the seventh takes place, here's what's going to take place. The mystery of God is going to be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. The, the, what the prophets, what the word of God has prophesied, is going to be fulfilled and realized with the beginning of the seventh trumpet as it is blown and the, the mystery of the will of God. Here we see in the, in the scriptures the mystery of God. We see the, the mystery of the Jew and the Gentile being united together into one, one body. The Old Testament believers, New Testament believers being united into one body. The Old Testament believers couldn't see that. It was a mystery. It was truth. It was kept hidden until a certain time and God released that truth. A mystery is something that God holds from us that we can never discover on our own, no matter what we do, till God decides to release that information to us. Second mystery is this. It's the prophetic will of God. Making known to us, God says, the, will, the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he has set forth in Jesus Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite everything in him, in Christ, in heaven and on earth. As the angel straddles heaven and earth, these things are being fulfilled. The purpose of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, is being fulfilled. There is a sovereign timetable. There is a sovereign plan. That is key. Don't delay. It is now about to happen. There is no longer time to delay. One of the things that the saints in heaven, the martyrs in heaven, have been praying as they're before the altar of God, we've seen, is crying out to God, God, how long? How long until you, until you avenge 
our debts, how long until you avenge sin, how long until you deal with sin, it is now being addressed. Whatever is said here that is sealed, we're going to know it when it happens. We can't know it ahead of time because we're not told. We can't even guess. He sealed it. He sealed it. We can't know that. We see in verse 5 and 6 as well that Jesus Christ, he is sovereign. He has a timetable. He is sovereign. He's in control. It is his authority under which these things are operating. We see the angel here. And the angel whom I saw standing on heaven, on sea, and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, and the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it. Yes, the Father was, was created for God, created the heavens and the earth. Chapter 4, he is lifted up as creator. And yet the word of God explicitly also declares that Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe. All things that were created were created by him. He was not created himself. Here we have the angel uh, declaring an oath to Jesus Christ. An oath to him that this is about to be carried out. An oath that, that this plan is about to unfold. There's a promise. And he is here to, to help fulfill that, to complete that. And, he's, and he declares the reality of this under the name of Jesus Christ. Some would say, well, this can't be, this angel can't be Christ because Jesus, the word God tells us not to swear. It, on occasion, it clearly does that. We see some of that in the Old Testament where, it's, where it is, uh, that has taken place. We see, three, we see multiple times God himself swears to his own name because no one is greater than himself. When he made a covenant with Abraham, when he affirmed that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the high priest, when he... And he gave the Davidic promise of the reign of Christ, uh, promised not to flood the earth, other things. It's not impossible that God could give an oath, make an oath to himself. We see that in Scripture. But the likelihood of this being Christ, this angel, simply does not fit because I believe in verse 1. And the fact that the angel is never, in, in Revelation, is never identified with Christ. It just isn't. And so we believe this is an angel, this is a mighty angel. And we are seeing the sovereignty of God here. We see also the reality that Jesus Christ is, is the living word here. Let's, let's look at this. Uh, verse 2, we see he had a little scroll open in his hand. A little scroll. And then that is described in verse 8. So let's look at that and see what the description is. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel, who is standing on the sea and on the land. And so I went to the angel, and I told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. And it was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I said, I was told, You must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. What we hear is the reality of divine revelation. This is the living word. I believe ultimately this is all about Jesus Christ. That scroll is, is again reflecting the living word revelation about Christ himself. And so we have this scroll that is, that is given, a scroll that, that we are told to, John is told to take it, to open it, to take, not to open it, take it and to eat it. That's what we're told. Is this the same scroll that we see in Revelation chapter 5? It's possible that it is. It's possible that it is... <laughs> Condensed so that it can it can be used in this word picture for John, uh, uh, fulfilling what has already been written on the scroll. There in chapter five, there are the seven thunders. Here the seven thunders roar, and something is said. It's not communicated, but it's not on the scroll. The scroll's contents were already written, even as it's given. The seven thunders communicate something separate from what's on the scroll. The scroll clearly is the will of God. The scroll clearly is the prophetic will of God. The scroll clearly is, is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's quite possible it simply is a fulfillment and carrying out of what is, what is true as, as declared on the scroll in Revelation 4 and 5. Simply a fulfillment of that. It is bitter. It is, it is a reflection that this is the day of the Lord. 
Isaiah chapter 13, verse 6, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty, it will come. Isaiah 3, Behold, the day of the Lord comes. It is cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. From the stars of the heavens and their constellations, they will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising. The moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and then lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. The scroll is showing the reality of the fulfillment of this. The day of the Lord is here. Because of chapter 9, when they refused to repent, now the final verdict is being declared. The scroll is reaffirming what is in the, the scroll that we see in chapter 4 to 5. The scroll is affirming the prophetic program of God, the will of God. It is affirming the day of the Lord, a judgment that is now to unfold on the earth, to be unleashed. The last half of the tribulation will be in, in terms that we can't even barely understand. The judgment will be so significant, so terrible. That's what's happening here. So when John is told to eat the scroll, it is sweet, it is bitter. It is bitter, it is sweet. First it is said it is bitter and then it is sweet. But as he, as he puts it in his mouth, as he receives the word of God, here's the thing. John says, go and take the scroll and then eat it. That's what he's told to do. He's not forced to take the word. He's not forced to receive the word. He has to make a choice at each step of the way. He has to receive a choice. He makes a choice. He says, will I, will I open the word of God? Will I receive it from the Lord? Will I internalize it into my life? Will I let it touch my life? This is, this is true of all of us as believers. See, the principles that flow from, from this word picture that ties to Revelation is still principles that affect your life and, my, and mine. Will I honor the Word of God? Will I love His revelation? Will I, will I read it, adhere to it? Will I internalize it? Will I bring its truth into my life? Its truth will touch my life. And you know what? Its truth will touch my life and it will hurt. Its truth will touch my life and it will be painful. Its truth will touch my life and it will make me change, turn from sin. It will call out sin in my life. Its truth will touch my life and remind me that He is holy and I am not. Its truth will touch my life and remind me that hell is real and I need a Savior. The Word of God touches our life and its first touch is bitter. In the sense that it shows a truth about ourselves that we don't like to see. At the same time, there's a sweetness about the Word of God because it is life-changing. It is life-transforming. It changes, it changes the evil in our life and it transforms it into the goodness of the character of Jesus Christ in our life. It, it, it brings the character of Christ into us so that we can be like Him. So we can view this world with His heartbeat through what He sees and how He sees this world. It changes us. It gives us hope for the very first time. It fills us with joy and blessing. It is a message of wrath, yes. But we are to share it. I want you to think about the Word of God. How is it touching your life? How is it impacting your life? And is it coming from your life as testimony to the lives of other people? Ultimately, when we think about this little passage, this chapter in chapter 10, John is being given this scroll, which ultimately is an affirmation of the will of God, this prophetic will of God. An angel, a divine angel, who is reflecting the very authority and power of Jesus Christ, who is not Jesus Christ himself, but is an angel serving him, who is, who is communicating in, in this picture that he is taking back this earth. He's taking back this world. He will establish his eternal kingdom. Satan will be defeated with all finality. He is authority. He has authority over heaven and earth, over sea, land, and the heavens. And the Word of God is the catalyst to all this. Jesus Christ is fulfilling the Word of God, the will of His Father. He came to do the will of His Father. He calls you and I to do the same thing. Even Jesus Christ knew that obedience came at a cost. He gave His life for us. He endured the mocking of men, the hatred of men. Being a believer, a child of God, it means enduring the challenges of being a believer, the cost of being a believer. There's a, there is a bitterness to the price that's to be paid. And yet, the Word of God ultimately is the sweetest thing that will ever touch our life. It is only good news. It is life transformative. We are to, we are to share Jesus Christ. 
We are to understand the power of the Word of Jesus Christ in our life. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. This is the New Living Translation. I like, I like this translation as it relates to this verse. Usually I use the ESV. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. People are to see Christ in us. That's what he calls us to do. He saves us so that people would see Christ in our life. It happens when the Word of God is touching our life. When its sweetness and its bitterness is touching our life. When we understand both sides of the biblical message, it changes us and it conforms us. When we understand the need for its truth holistically in our life, when we understand that we need the whole counsel of God, it transforms us. When we understand that we are to convey that to a world who needs the truth of the Word of God, we're to convey it. We're not to just share the good parts. We're not just to, to give what people want to hear. We're not just to scratch itching ears so that, so that we just communicate what they want to hear. We're to communicate the truth of God. We're to live out the truth of God. Our testimonies will stand in contrast to people who are unrepentant, who are unwilling to, to change their lives and to turn from their sin. We will be a stark contrast to their life and they may hate us for that they will hate us for that and they will hate you for that we need to understand that this is transformative and life-giving our lives are to, are to reveal jesus christ at every turn and everything that we do but this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing it's amazing the truth of jesus christ in this world it is it is either it is either something that I hate and can't stand, or it is, it is life-giving and life-altering. It is either good news, or it's bad news. And our world will respond in one of only two ways to the Word of God. Either rejected, or accepted by faith. To those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and of doom. They don't want to hear what we have to say. They don't want to see the standards of Christ lived out before them. They don't want their life to be challenged. They don't want their sin to be challenged. They don't want their way of living to be challenged. They want to follow after their own heart. They want to set their own standards. They don't want to be told that, that there is a God who, to whom man is accountable. They don't want to hear that news. That is, that is destruction and destructive in their life. It destroys everything that they hold dear in their life. They don't want to hear it. There's a spiritual battle going on. To those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. We are a fragrance in their life. We meet the very need of their life that they have been searching for their whole life. You know, as a sinner, we are always constantly searching for meaning. We are always constantly searching for value, inward value, life value, for purpose. We are always searching for what is the meaning of life. When we meet Jesus Christ, those questions are answered in Jesus Christ. And the Word of God becomes a sweetness in our life. It touches us first with the bitterness. I'm a sinner. I, I, I can't have a relationship with God until I yield to Jesus Christ and let Him wash me, to, until I confess my sin and let Him forgive me and let Him change me. And there's a sweetness that comes. It is the good news of the Gospel. As you and I live Jesus Christ out, there's going to be one or two responses against your testimony against my testimony. People will be moved closer towards Christ and ultimately receive Christ. That's the work of God, not ours. We're simply a testimony to them. Or people will reject and move away from us and seek to destroy us because of the truth that's being communicated. Their response, if we are doing it out of grace and love, their response is a reflection of their understanding of Jesus Christ. We've been given a great task. We've been given a great obligation to share Jesus Christ, to live Jesus Christ. We are to live in such a way that people are brought to decision in their life. We are to live, to such, live in such a way that people see our lives and the truth of God that comes out of our lives, to see how we live our lives, and they are to be brought to a place of decision about where they stand with Jesus Christ. Our life is to seek to bring people to decision, not just to, just to give a general awareness, but to bring people to decision about Jesus Christ. And who is adequate for such a task as this? Well, that's a great question. I mean, who is adequate? I don't feel adequate. The Bible says we're not adequate. Except when we yield to Jesus Christ. We are adequate when we let the Spirit of God 
have His way in our conversation. When we let the Spirit of God have His way in how we live our life. And we let the Word of God take the truth of His Word and use it in the heart of one who is hearing that truth for the first time. It is God's work. We are simply messengers as this angel is. We may even be mighty in power because of the Spirit of God. We will reflect Jesus Christ in glory and in power because of Christ in us. We won't have fire on, on our legs and we won't have faces that shine as the sun and we won't have a be come on a cloud and have a rainbow around us, but you know what? There will be grace. They will infiltrate every part of our testimony. And the grace of Jesus Christ that will touch people's lives because of Jesus Christ first transforming us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind. Folks, that's the strength of God in your life. That's the character of God in your life. That's the power and the quality of Jesus Christ in you. And when people see that power and the glory of Christ and the change and the transformation that Christ is bringing in your life, then we are able to love our neighbors ourselves. They will see us love in a way that they've never seen. That's grace. That needs to be the call of our life. We're called to share Jesus Christ. First, walk with Him. Internalize His Word. When you internalize His Word, it will touch your life first. It will painfully bring changes that are necessary. It will painfully conform you, which turns into blessing and sweetness, conform you and I to Jesus Christ. As we conform, the character of Christ becomes strength and sweetness and blessing in our life and in testimony. So when you think about this passage, think not just about the prophetic timetable, the prophetic word, the revealing of God's word, the coming of the kingdom that's just about to happen, the, the final judgment that's just about to happen, the second half of the tribulation. Think not just about those things, but also think about your testimony in mind. Are you willing to receive the word of God? Are you willing to obey it? Are you willing to let it change you? Are you willing in all of the whole counsel of God to let it touch your life? And then are you willing to simply be a vessel for the Lord, to be a conduit of blessing of God's love and grace? May that be your heartbeat, because that reflects that you are a child of God, that I am a child of God. Folks, pray that that is the case in your life. Yield to Christ so that that may be true. He's not going to delay here. It's about to take place. He wants to work in your life and mine as well. May today be the day he continues his powerful work in your life and mine. Thank you for coming. We'll continue in Revelation and continue to learn and to grow. We're going to see gospel witness come alive in the coming chapter. And I can't wait. It's pretty exciting. We're seeing God be awesome in the book of Revelation. What he is there, he is still today. And uh, may we learn and grow, be transformed. Thank you for joining with us. We'll see you next time.